Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Economics 2355, uh, which is a class about curating data at scale. Um, and so today I want to just give a little bit of an overview of what are the problems that this class is trying to solve? Uh, what are the methods that we're going to use? Um, just sort of uh, by way of housekeeping, if at any point um, you have a question or you want to jump in, um, you can either just unmute yourself or um, if you'd rather not do that, um, you can feel free to use um, the chat to send a question um, or you can raise your hand. Um, and uh, Jake Carlson, who's our awesome TA for this class will um, call on you um, if you've raised your hand um, or is happy to ask a question uh, for you um, if you wanna send it via the chat. And so I think we'll probably, you know, just uh, keep experimenting and figure, figure out the best way to run things. Um, but we'll start out um, with, with trying that. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started now. Um, and so I wanna start before even, you know, going into the details of exactly what we're going to do in the course, I wanna start by talking about why data curation and specifically data curation at scale is so important to doing research. Um, and then after we go through that, we'll have a bit of a, you know, um, a 10,000 feet overview of uh, the sorts of tools that we're going to be using in the course um, and why they're actually necessary. Um, and then finally, if we have time, we'll go over, you know, the specific details of the topics and reading lists on the syllabus. Okay. Um, and so the objective of this course is to use revolutionary methods from deep learning uh, in order to be able to process data at scale. Um, and so data curation is super central um, to what we do as economists or social scientists because the data you have access to is going to fundamentally shape uh, the questions that you think of in the first place uh, that you even think of as you know something that, that, that could be a question that you can answer. Um, and certainly is going to condition um, the questions that are feasible to answer. Um, and so economics specifically, empirical social science more generally is a pretty young field. And I think we've barely begun to scratch the surface in terms of illuminating the questions that are uh, most important to people's lives um, and to the well-functioning of society. So just to give a bit of historical background, um, if you go back before modern computing, in other words, before there are personal computers, um, you know, social scientists for a long time have wanted to bring empirical observation um, to um, their hypotheses, but empirical analysis in the way that we use the term today uh, requires computing. And so back, you know, before the early um, 1990s, you know, in the days where simple regressions would take many hours to run potentially, you know, on a mainframe computer. Um, by and large, the only information uh, that could serve as data points for empirical analysis um, was macro data. So say like, you know, time series data about GDP in the US economy. Um, and so Quantitative researchers spent most of their time thinking about the sliver of questions that could be answered with that kind of data. And most economists weren't quantitative researchers, researchers at all. They were mostly theorists. Um, and so if there were questions that these data could not answer, um, they were considered you know, outside the realm of quantitative social science, outside the realm of economics. And they were either left to qualitative analysis or essentially, you know, ignore it altogether, um, no matter how important they were to people's lives. Um, you know, we just didn't have much to say. And so you can think of this, for example, in the context of development economics, which as a field basically didn't exist within academic economics prior to the 1990s. You know, there were some development planners at the World Bank, um, but, you know, by and large, Economics was theoretical. There were certain assumptions like, you know, perfect competition and perfect information um, in economic models that just clearly are not a good, you know, um, approximation of 
the important issues in development economics. You know, there wasn't much in the way of data. Um, and so um, it just, it just, you know, economists didn't think about it, even though it's clearly, you know, ex ante, an enormously important part of, you know, thinking about economics. Um, and so this all changed during the 1990s um, with the massive growth um, in the power of personal computing. Um, which completely revolutionized um, social science and it unleashed what I call the first empirical revolution. Um, so it both changed the type of data that could be collected um, and the types of data um, that we as academics could process. Um, and this in turn fundamentally influenced the questions we asked and nowhere, nowhere has this been sort of more true than in economics. Um, you know, initially economics was very theoretical, very macroeconomic, very correlational. Um, and I think that the aggregated nature of these comparisons and the simplified nature of them uh, were a turnoff to many qualitative social scientists who focused you know, on questions that required disaggregated information to answer. Um, and the computing revolution made it possible to create just an enormous amount of knowledge about the micro foundations of important economic phenomena. Um, so today, you know, even macroeconomists make very extensive use of massive firm level data sets uh, to understand the microeconomic origins of the macroeconomic phenomenon that they study. Um, and causal identification, um, which is you know, really the, the bedrock of empirical economics today marched hand in hand with advances in computing um, because more disaggregated data as well as lower costs for collecting um, data unleashed many more ways in which you could isolate causal effects, um, which is gonna be a pretty difficult thing to do with macroeconomic data points. Um, so this happened through having the computing power that you would need to analyze data from natural experiments, but it also happened because computing facilitated uh, the collection of new data um, through efforts like household surveys um, and randomized control trials. And so it's hard to imagine a field like development economics um, having developed the insights that it has had over the past 30 years uh, without advances in computing um, that were essentially uh, behind uh, the first empirical revolution in the 1990s. Okay, and so like I argue that we're now at the beginnings of uh, what I call a second empirical revolution. And as with the first empirical revolution uh, from personal computing, um, the current empirical revolution is also spurred uh, by monumental advances in computing. Um, but this time, um, what it has made possible um, is deep learning based methods, um, which offer an enormous number of potential applications to social science. Okay, so in order to see this, like, let's think a little bit about, you know, what could be raw data, or raw information for social science. Um, raw information may take the form of image scans of historical documents. It could be scans of tables, uh, scans of firm level reports, government documents, newspapers, directories, um, you know, many, many possibilities. Um, these scans are often of poor quality and the layouts in these documents tend to be highly complex. Um, Raw social science data might also be contained in just reams of text. You can imagine, you know, at the extreme tens or hundreds of millions of pages of text. Um, it can also be contained in photographs, videos, audio file, satellite imagery, um, a variety of other formats. And deep learning has the potential to unlock, you know, traditional types of data, what we're used to thinking of as data at a large scale in contexts where manual digitization is unfeasible, you know, so perhaps there's historical census manuscripts and, you know, for some high resource countries like the US, um, historical census manuscripts have been digitized, uh, at least certain ones of them have, you know, others haven't. So certainly deep learning can um, help us to automate the digitization with high accuracy of those traditional types of data at scale but it can also just completely change the types of information that can be converted into computable data 
um, which is a prerequisite um, for use in empirical analysis. Um, so just to take kind of a fun example, you know, there's a saying that a picture is worth a thousand words and historians talk all the time about iconic images that appeared historically in media. Um, and deep learning based methods could allow us to track the dissemination of photographs across millions of pages of historical media, tag what the specific images contain, you know, et cetera, something that would be just totally infeasible to do manually. And in that sense could change what's a quantitative question versus what would be like a qualitative question that a historian might, you know, answer by looking at specific examples. Um, and so just to give another example, suppose, you know, an, an important question in economics is to understand, you know, fundamental questions about how societies change and grow over time. Uh, but if you want to take those questions um, seriously, um, you need to essentially to understand the trajectories of those societies and not just, you know, at the macroeconomic or aggregate level, uh, but the trajectories of individuals, firms, communities. Um, and, you know, many questions related to this are just impossible to shed light on with aggregate data. So suppose you want to look at misallocation or inequality, um, you know, that, that that's going to be difficult to do with aggregate data. Um, both of those are likely to be important um, to, to, to this phenomenon. So we really need rich disaggregated data and they actually do exist oftentimes stretching back at least decades, if not centuries. Um, but you know, the data that we need, they could be scattered throughout reams of text. Um, they could be tracked in images or hard copy documents um, and manually converting these sources into computable data um, could be prohibitively costly, you know, whether it's text and you're looking for certain information there and trying to quantify that, um, you know, or whether it's, you know, tables that, that are in hard copy and you want to get them into a structured digital format. Okay, so, you know, the, the good news here is that uh, both the computing power and the methods that we need to curate all those types of raw information that I was talking about at scale um, already exist. And they've already really transformed a variety of other domains. Um, however, by and large, uh, without fine tuning these methods to our applications, um, which requires some methodological innovations, some tailored interfaces and active research community, um, if you just take these methods and apply them off the shelf, um, they'll, they'll tend to fail badly because they weren't pre-trained, you know, specifically on our types of applications. You, we have to fine tune them to our applications. Um, and if we just limit ourselves to the methods developed by other fields for data curation, uh, we'll also severely limit the questions that we as social scientists uh, can ask. Okay, so that's kind of the um, very broad overview about um, why data curation matters. Um, so I don't know if anybody has any questions or thoughts and wants to jump in. Um, so in general, um, the data curation pipeline um, that we'll be talking about has um, the following steps. And um, so which of these steps you need is gonna depend on your specific project. Like um, some projects, um, you know, you just, you may just need step four. Um, you know, some projects you may need steps one through three, some projects you may need all of them. And it's just, it's just gonna depend. Um, and so first of all, you need to detect the content regions um, in your document of interest if you're working with raw image data. So that could be like the cells of a table, um, but maybe you have a book and you wanna extract all the images and that could be recognizing the images and their associated captions, okay? It's just gonna depend on exactly what sort of information you wanna process. Um, then um, if part of what you've extracted from the document is images of text, you're going to need to OCR that. You know, some projects you won't need that, that's not of interest, um, but some projects you will. Um, then you're going to need to do some post-processing and database assembly. Um, and then um, you may need to convert the information to computable format. So you may be extracting structured text from documents and then you need to do NLP on that 
um, because you can't uh, perform analyses on raw text. Um, so let me talk about each of these steps in a little bit more detail. Um, okay, so if you're starting um, with hard co copy publications or image scans, um, as opposed to starting out with structured data, um, you need to, um, you know, you need to be able to convert those into a computable format. Um, and um, so just digitizing the words or the numbers contained in the documents is not sufficient. You also need to be able to extract the text structures, which tells you what different pieces of information in that document are and how they relate to each other. So if it's just a standard table, there might be table headers, rows, columns, footnotes, um, et cetera. Um, you can imagine that you're digitizing newspapers. And in that case, the different um, types of um, elements in that document will be like headlines, articles, images, advertisements, captions. Um, so unfortunately, off the shelf tools are rarely capable of auto detecting structures um, within your documents when the typesetting is complicated, uh, which is often the case in documents that we want to process. Um, and moreover, they don't use the layouts as a hint for estimating what the texts are. Um, so they, they're not capable of understanding the layouts. Um, in short, commercial OCR softwares have been optimized for single column books and perform poorly in recognizing the structures um, in documents, especially if it's a noisy historical scan that have complex layouts. Um, so I'm gonna give an example um, from Google Cloud Vision, which is the leading commercial OCR software um, on historical newspaper uh, scans. And so I'm gonna show you um, the layout analysis that it does. And so, um, Google Cloud Vision um, detects paragraph bounding boxes, right? Um, where the paragraph is kind of supposed to be the um, fundamental, um, uh, the fundamental unit in your document. Um, and so, if you see here, it's a little bit hard to see. I'm sure, like um, on a just a, a small screen. Um, but what Google Cloud Vision has done here is it reads this seven-column newspaper as if it's a single-column book. Um, and so everything in it gets garbled. Um, it also has no way to recognize what's a headline, an article, a caption, um, an advertisement, because it has no idea that it's looking at a newspaper. Um, and so those are all gonna be mixed up. And so basically you're just gonna get a huge jumble of words. And it does this on kind of um, the vast majority of newspaper scans that you would feed it. Um, this is another example. This is a pretty simple layout. Um, from a newspaper, um, just two columns at the top, three columns at the bottom, but still it cannot detect those two columns. It reads them like a single column book and you see for the three columns at the bottom, it, it just produces complete garbage. There's a bunch of unstable bounding boxes that are all overlapping and just sees that and has no idea what it's looking at. Um, and um, you know, if this were a, ta a complex table, like it would be even worse. Um, it would fail to detect entire regions altogether. Small changes in pre-processing the document can lead to completely different results. You know, in short, like um, it's just not, it, it, it's really struggling to, to figure out what it's seeing here. Um, and so this matters uh, for the questions that the literature tackles. And so what I've just shown you um, with newspapers means that the, um, you know, the literature uh, that uses historical newspapers, um, typically what it does is just look for keywords. Um, because if all you want to see is how many times like the word boat appeared in this newspaper, um, then you don't need to recognize any of the document structures. Um, and so the literature can't answer like any questions that would take us the input headlines or captions or sentences or paragraphs or full articles, um, which is a, kind of a lot of the questions that you would want to answer. Anything relating to sentiment, keywords aren't great at picking up topics because you know there's something like 200,000 words in the English language and there's a lot of different ways to say the same things. Um, as you can imagine, you know, the OCR is also riddled with um, noise and errors. Um, 
And so, yeah, there's just a lot of important questions that we might want to answer. And if you just, you know, satisfy yourself um, with what you get from sticking it into the existing commercial tool, um, you're not going to be able to answer um, those questions. You know, there are some questions that can be answered with keywords and they're interesting and important, but there's lots and lots of questions that can't. Okay, um, so just to give another example, um, I'm going to show you an example from a Japanese biographical document. Um, it's from a 1953 volume that contains detailed biographies for over 50,000 uh, prominent individuals. And each biography contains a header for the person's name and a subheader for their position and then their biography. Um, and so these are the um, uh, paragraph and text blocks that Google Cloud Vision detects. And again, you can see it's pretty unusable. Like the blocks are immediately obvious to the human eye. Like even if you don't speak a word of Japanese, you see like the big font is the person's name with their position next to it. And then there's the biography block. But you know, this just doesn't look like what Google Cloud Vision was trained on and it gets really confused and produces output that is unusable. Um, and importantly, um, the failure to detect layouts leads to an oftentimes substantial deterioration in the quality of the OCR of individual words, uh, with some text failing to be uh, detected altogether. Because if you can't know the layouts, then you don't even know where to look for the text. Um, and so, you know, with OCR software like Abby, you could manually draw the boxes around kind of each layout element in your page, uh, but that's very labor intensive and expensive um, and hasn't been performed uh, for the vast majority of historical documents. You know, in the case of newspapers, you know, maybe the New York Times, um, uh, you know, did this on their articles, but, but, but by and large, it hasn't been done. Okay. And so, of course, beyond knowing the location of different um, regions in a document scan, um, we want to know the different types of regions. Um, and um, so, uh, for example, um, if there was a table, probably at a minimum, you would want to know if something was a title, a column header, a row header, a cell value, a caption, etc. cetera. Um, tables, of course, can also be significantly more complex. Um, Alternatively, um, with newspapers, you'd want to know what's a page header, a headline, an article, text, um, image captions, advertisements, etc. And so, you know, this is an example of what you would want the output of document layout analysis um, to look like. Um, and, um, you know, so you see the purple header region, there's blue articles, yellow headlines, etc., the green images and captions. Um, the orange advertisements and cartoons and mass heads of the paper. Um, and so this is kind of, this, this is what you would, um, this is what you would want the output to look like. Um, and um, so each content region on that page was defined by its coordinates and its class, you know, heart, headline, article, et cetera. Um, and so in order to do this, this is fundamentally an object detection task that is completely analogous to how detecting cats in a photograph is an object detection task. It's analogous to, you know, um, tagging people in, an, in a photograph that you upload to Facebook. And the exact same object detection models um, that are used for those problems um, can be fine tuned uh, to our context and used on these documents. Of course, if you just take a model um, that has been used to detect kind of people, um, you know, in the photographs on your iPhone and you apply it to one of these documents, you're going to get disappointing performance, but actually the model has already been pre-trained to detect objects and it's kind of, you know, in the right vicinity of where you need to be. And so you'll need to do additional labeling to fine tune, but it's essentially, it's exactly kind of that framework um, that is used um, to, um, to be able to um, detect the different regions and classes of objects in these documents. And we're gonna spend a fair amount of time talking about object detection models. Okay, 
And so oftentimes, although not always, um, the second step of your pipeline will be um, OCR. Um, and you know, again, if you just <laughs> send the raw documents to OCR, you're going to be disappointed with the results uh, for the reasons that I showed above. It may be necessary to optimally stack individual layout regions to achieve the best results because the complex and non-standard layouts often lead to a deterioration in OCR performance. Um, you may need to do image pre-processing to significantly enhance OCR accuracy, and we'll talk about that. Um, in some cases, it still might not be enough. Um, in that case, you know, you either, you know, won't be able to go forward um, or you may need to design your own character recognition image, which depending on um, what you need to do um, may actually be pretty straightforward. And we'll talk about that. Okay, step three um, is post-processing and database assembly. Um, so typically, some additional post-processing and database assembly will be necessary before you proceed to additional data analysis. You know, so if you had tables, you need to know which sale cells are associated with specific row or column head headers. Um, if the text is wrapped within the table, you need to be able to combine the table cells together in the appropriate order. And different types of tables in the same document may associate text differently, which underscores the importance of using object detection, not just to detect individual layout elements, um, but also different layout sections uh, contained in the document, uh, which is something that we'll talk about. Um, one would also like to do just more traditional post-processing, you know, make sure the rows and columns add up appropriately, you know, check for outliers, etc. Um, so let me give another example of post-processing from newspapers. Um, you know, you would probably want to associate headlines with article and images with their captions. Um, the articles may be wrapped in complex ways across columns or appear on multiple pages and they need to be associated with each other. You know, here NLP would potentially come into play in post-processing. Um, a very common thing when you are OCRing text is that the OCR engine um, gets very confused about punctuation. It thinks periods are commas and commas are periods and it hallucinates periods from text bleed and it gets confused about hyphens. And if you just take that text and apply NLP on it, it's going to wreak havoc because NLP assumes that you have a coherent sentence structure. Um, you know, but, but fortunately uh, there are post-processing ways including deep learning based ways to remove punctuation errors. Okay, so finally, you need to convert information into computable format. So if you're just working with a table, you may essentially be done after the previous step, uh, but many types of data require additional processing um, in order to be able to convert the data into something that's computable. Um, so suppose you're working with newspaper articles. Um, the text of an article is not a computable object. Um, instead, you need to use NLP to embed the article text. Um, which itself is high dimensional and sparse into a denser and lower dimensional object that's suitable for the downstream analyses that you wanna do. These downstream analyses might include retrieval, um, which is super important if you're working with a large database, um, topic classification and sentiment analysis, um, which will all receive extensive attention in the course. Um, and, um, as is the case with object detection, um, existing state-of-the-art models can be fine-tuned uh, to perform well on these tasks. So this is just an example pipeline um, for a project with newspapers. So you need to do the layout analysis, which you see on the left, and then you take those individual content regions, you OCR them, you need to assemble them in post-processing. And then you need to embed the text in order to you know, be able to do the downstream statistical analyses that are of interest. Okay, and I wanna say a word about the general sort of philosophy of this pipeline. Um, so there's three different methods that you could use um, to perform the pipeline. Uh, the first one is manual labor. Um, and you know, oftentimes manual labor can't be avoided, including in like deep learning where you need annotated data. Um, but obviously our aim is to do as little manual labor as possible. Um, the second approach is rule-based methods. And these are effectively 
uh, the status quo and computer vision uh, based approaches to document layout analysis, as well as in post processing. Um, and many social scientists often use rules, uh, such as a keyword search for like text processing. Um, and then finally, there's deep learning, um, which can underlie every step um, in the above analysis. Um, and so, you know, if we want to go the automated approach, we can either write a set of instructions that tells the computer how to process the data uh, by defining a series of rules, or we can let the computer learn how to process the data by providing it with empirical examples um, and then using deep learning. Okay, um, so rule-based approaches have the advantage of being easy to understand and like familiar to most of us. Usually the way that we're used to interacting with a computer is based on you know, rule-based approaches um, and rules have their place and we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, but um, we have found that they often perform poorly compared to deep learning. Um, and in large part, the reason for this is because complexity and noise, which are related to each other, you can think of noise as a form of complexity, um, are the enemy of rules. Um, because then you have exceptions to the rules and exceptions to the exceptions to the exceptions. Um, and it's just, you know, really a mess and leads to disappointing results. And social science documents tend to be full of complexity and noise. Um, and um, so essentially, you know, as a rule, I'm not a huge fan of rules. And, you know, this is true from anything from, you know, a complex table with a poor noisy scan um, to a text document, um, which again, like the English language is full of complexity. There's many different ways to say something. Um, and, and rules tend to be disappointing compared to human performance. Um, whereas what we want with automation is to be able to approximate or beat human performance on the same tasks. Um, and so in the next uh, class, we'll discuss various examples of rule-based approaches um, and why the results tend to be disappointing relative to deep learning. Okay. And so generally, um, deep learning can play a central role in every step of the pipeline that I showed you above. Um, and so it is what makes layout analysis and image pre-processing possible. Um, OCR uses deep learning. Um, oftentimes assembling structured data and post-processing uses deep learning. And it underlies natural language processing. And so the, the, the methods that we use to do computer vision tasks like you know, the document layout analysis and NLP are actually very, very similar. Um, even though, you know, to, to people who might not be familiar with deep learning, these seem like very different tasks, um, but actually they're quite analogous. Um, okay, are there any questions about the pipeline? Okay, um, so I wanna talk a little bit more about um, why this is necessary um, to sort of uh, preemptively answer some questions that, that you all might have. And so um, when I tell people about what I've been working on, probably the most common reaction is, you know, but isn't there an app or some other commercial product that does this? Um, and unfortunately, the answer to that question is no. Um, the Office Self Solutions um, for our data curation aims um, tend to perform quite poorly. And in fact, they don't get anywhere close to acceptable accuracy. And you guys already saw an example with, of that um, that I showed you with Google Cloud Vision. Um, and so um, there's many challenges to converting information into computable data. Um, and if you're starting um, with um, uh, raw scans of documents um, or other images, um, the first and foremost challenge is that commercial OCR softwares and other off-the-shelf models cannot auto-detect um, complex layouts that characterize most quantitative documents. Um, so commercial softwares are primarily trained on clean, modern documents that have simple layouts, uh, like single column books. Whereas we are interested in noisy historical documents, you know, in large part, um, many of which have highly complex layouts. 
And we're a long way from achieving, you know, what's called artificial general intelligence or AGI. Um, if softwares haven't been trained on documents that look like the documents you want to process, um, they're going to perform poorly. And so this is again, um, you know, to refresh your memory, the example I showed you from Google Cloud Vision. Here's another example. Um, you know, I've talked with the engineers at Google Cloud about, you know, whether they have any plans to kind of introduce, you know, um, fine tuning on demand or other things. Um, and it seems like that that is not necessarily like a priority. Um, so we did exhaustive testing. We found Google Cloud Vision was about the best out there. If you look at other things like PubLinet, which is the state of the art pre-trained model um, that's open source for layout understanding, it completely fails to detect the layouts of the historical newspapers. Um, and so why is it that this software completely fails? Um, right now, um, document layout analysis and object detection more generally rely on supervised learning. And there are just not labeled data sets that are representative of the vast diversity of documents that are of interest to social scientists. And so since the model hasn't been trained on examples that looks like the data that we want to process on um, uh, the off the shelf solution isn't going to, to work just by hitting a button. Um, and this is important because even if you don't care about the layouts, it's going to lead to um, a decline in OCR quality, it may fail to detect, you know, kind of entire regions of documents. Okay, so I think it's important to understand about why the off the shelf solutions perform poorly, because it tells us about the problems that we need to solve. And so generally, there's four reasons. Um, our documents tend to have complex layouts with lots of sparsity, noisy backgrounds, um, different fonts and noisy fonts um, and noisy scanning technology. Okay. Um, and so essentially deep learning, which underlies the um, layout analysis and OCR that commercial OCR products perform are data hungry. Um, and these products were trained on corpuses that consist primarily of modern documents that have dense, clean layouts, which is not what our documents have. Um, and you know, even if Google cared about making their product perform better for our documents, um, there's just not the labeled data sets that would be needed um, to make them work better because annotating documents is labor intensive. And there's a, just a vast array of documents that, that we as social science researchers um, might want to process. Um, in addition to the complex layouts of our documents, um, if they are historical documents, they use different fonts um, than modern documents. Um, and again, um, the computer can recognize characters that are reasonably similar to those that it has been exposed to in training. Um, there are many historical fonts that are not present in modern document corpuses. And even if similar fonts are present today, um, historical printing technology is much noisier than modern printing. The stroke widths vary uh, depending on the amount of ink that was left in the printing press. And so to give an example um, from some of our historical Japanese documents, um, they used a font for numbers and a balance sheet uh, that is flatter than modern fonts. And even though it's completely trivial for a human to look at it and know what number it is, um, Google Cloud Vision just could not detect those as characters. Um, and it just returned no content for those regions. Um, and so therefore, um, we didn't have no choice but to train our own OCR engine, um, which is actually pretty straightforward in the case of numbers because there aren't that many of them. Okay, um, you know, another reason why the off the shelf solutions struggle is that they're trained on documents with clean background. Um, and text bleed is a major issue in historical documents due to the types of inks used, the aging of the documents, and the scanner settings. If you flash too much light at a document when you're scanning it, it's going to make the text bleed through from the other side of the page. Um, and this creates a problem that we called ghost ones, um, where essentially, since you can see the text bleeding through 
like faintly from the other side of the page, um, the OCR engine would think that there were characters there. And for some reason, it oftentimes thought they were ones. And obviously, if you're digitizing tables, this is a big problem. Because if you put a one in front of a number where it doesn't belong, you've just changed everything by an order of magnitude. I mean, more generally, um, the text blade just leads to a deterioration in the performance of both the layout analysis and the OCR. And so deep learning is an incredibly powerful tool um, for pre-processing images uh, to remove the text blade. Um, and then finally, many commercial products are trained on clean scans. Um, you know, if you're scanning a book um, and you didn't take off the binding, it's not going to be completely flat and that's going to lead to distortions. Um, and you may, like many of the scans that are out there just were scanned with poor settings. Um, and again, deep learning based pre-processing can help. Okay. Um, and so as I said, like, I don't think it's likely that you're going to be able to sign into Google Cloud Vision and have it detect the layouts and the documents you want to use anytime soon. Um, because even if a commercial product wanted to integrate training data from historical documents, which are super varied, the data don't exist at scale. Um, and it wouldn't be lucrative for them to create that data um, given how many documents they are and how small the size of the market is um, for being able to digitize those documents. Um, but fortunately, um, you know, if you have a document and you want to process that, um, it's a fairly straightforward problem. Um, you need to create some labeled data, not nearly as much as you would need if you were pre-training from scratch. Um, and I've been working on developing tools that allow researchers to create annotated data sets as cheaply as possible. Um, we have an open source package called Layout Parser that can integrate labeled data sets for object detection, um, making it easier for researchers to detect layouts on similar documents. Um, and um, we'll be releasing an open source annotation tool that incorporates active learning uh, geared towards um, documents um, in the near future. Okay, um, you might be wondering, are there hacks um, that can make off the shelf tools work better? Um, and, you know, I'm pretty sure that, that, that um, we've spent more time than anyone <laughs> trying to hack Google Cloud Vision and make it work well. Um, and, you know, I will share some of, uh, of what we've learned in the course. Okay. Of course, creating computable measures go beyond recognizing the layouts and doing OCR. Um, you need to be able to correctly associate different content regions with each other. Um, how these regions are associated differs vastly across documents and even within documents. Um, and it's really hard to imagine an off the self commercial product that would be able to infer such a wide range of associations. I mean, sometimes even for you to understand the structure of the information of the table you're looking at, you might have to go and read the front material in your volume. Um, even once you have the structured information out of the documents, it may not be computable yet. So for example, raw text uh, requires natural language processing to convert it into a format that's computable. Okay, so I've talked a fair bit about, um, you know, off the shelf um, uh, layout analysis and OCR. What about off the shelf NLP? Um, that is usually not gonna work either. Um, so there's been hype around models that work without fine tuning and we'll examine the most promising advances. Um, however, um, for most applications, you're still going to need to fine tune. Um, so just to give an example, um, OpenAI um, has hailed the release of an NLP model called GPT-3, um, which they argue can do as well as other leading NLP models that have been fine-tuned, but without requiring fine-tuning. Um, however, first of all, this by and large isn't the case when you depart from the benchmark tasks that are used to evaluate the performance of NLP models, which most of our applications would. Um, and moreover, this model is enormous. Um, you know, it takes, it has to be distributed over many, many GPUs. You know, you couldn't run it on your personal um, GPU and OpenAI sold it to Microsoft, which now has it behind a paywall as a proprietary black box. Um, 
which is just not going to bode well for academic application. So you go, you want to do an NLP task, you put in your data, it spits something out. You don't know why, um, because it's proprietary. Um, but you know, you proceed with your paper. Um, nobody can examine the robustness of the assumptions of the model because we don't know what they are. If Microsoft changes the model, it's going to change, you know, what you get out and make it non-reproducible, right? So you can just see why this compared to, you know, you take another state of the art NLP model um, and you fine tune it and all of that's reproducible and people can take it and do other things and see if you get the same results, et cetera. That's just much more conducive to, um, to academic research. Um, and as I said, I don't think that we are close to having a commercial solution where you hit a button and out pops your structured data or your meaningful computable text anytime soon. I do think OCR is going to improve a lot in the next five to 10 years because there's potential there, you know, for, for data augmentation. So I've talked about how well the issue is that we don't have labeled data and labeled data is costly to create. But imagine you could just simulate documents at scale. Um, you know, um, and you've simulated them, so you have the labels, um, you know, something like that could really revolutionize it. I mean, so I do think that we'll see improvements, um, but it doesn't obviate the need to understand these methods and to be able to fine tune them yourself if you wanna curate data at scale. Okay, um, so another question that comes up all the time is why not just send the data off for manual entry? Um, <laughs> And, um, and people will say things like, well, why spend time developing methods and applying methods when you could just outsource this, you know, send it to somebody in Cambodia. Um, and I've sent data off for manual entry. I've also entered manually lots and lots of data myself. And ultimately um, this experience is unsatisfactory. Um, for many reasons. I'm gonna talk about, you know, the top seven reasons it's unsatisfactory. Um, so, you know, let's suppose that you have a data set um, and it would actually be feasible to manually digitize it. It's not so huge that that is an impossible problem. Um, and so you've gone and you've, you're looking at the website of a data entry company. And it's going to tell you um, that you can order double entry and that will have greater than 99% accuracy, which sounds pretty good, right? And researchers who advocate for manual entry often repeat those numbers, um, but unfortunately, we have found accuracy to be much lower, um, even from highly recommended firms. And so we found that there, that when you check carefully through double entered data, there tend to be more errors, including very serious errors, right? So suppose that you're digitizing a table and all the table cells get moved down one relative to the row header. So suppose the row headers are municipality names and the values are like average income in the municipality and those values get moved down one row. Now every number is associated with the wrong observation, you know, meaning your data is like unusable um, until you spend a lot of time fixing it. Um, and so why is this? Um, you know, what we think is going on is that most data entry companies will use OCR as a first pass, uh, manually annotating the layouts on your documents by drawing boxes. Um, and then they'll send them um, to, the, um, to the double entry people, the two people that are entering it to manually correct the errors. Um, and so if you have two people working from the same base data set, the same base document to correct errors and neither is being very attentive, many errors are going to remain, right? So the people that are double entering, since they're not entering it from scratch, those are not independent people entering the data. And so you, if you want 99% accuracy, they would need to independently be entering things. Um, and, um, so as I said, like when people draw the layout boxes wrong, this can lead to, to really serious errors. Um, and an essential step, if you wanna see that your data has been entered correctly is to check whether the numbers add up appropriately. Um, you know, the, if there's a total row or total column, numbers should add up. But of course, an observant person who is digitizing the data may also notice that there's a total row and use an Excel formula to generate it, which means that you no longer have a way to check if there's errors systematically, um, you know, which is another thing that, 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 that they'll do um, that can make life more difficult. Okay, so reason number two um, is that the quality of manual entry declines as the size of the data set increases. Um, 
And this happens because data entry firms typically work by hiring freelancers and they're going to use their better freelancers first. As the size of the job increases, they may have to tap into freelancers who are not very careful in order to meet the huge amount of demand that you've created for them. And hence for larger data sets in our experience, um, manual entry was particularly problematic. Reason number three, many data sets that are required to answer pressing questions are too large for manual entry. Um, you know, if you want to study inequality, misallocation, networks, um, those are all, you know, fields that are transforming sort of economics and are really important to people's lives. Um, but you can't study those things necessarily with aggregated data or with a sample. Um, and so let's say you want to study inequality and you want to do that with a sample, that's going to be really problematic because you're going to probably miss the top tails, um, which are important. Um, this is also a well-known problem with networks um, that, that uh, taking a sample can bias your results. Um, yet typically the full data sets are too large to digitize manually. Okay, so this leaves um, a few alternatives. You could focus on recently compiled data sets that are already in a machine readable format. You could focus on a narrow context. So you could study firms like in a single city instead of in the entire country. Um, you could choose questions that can be examined with more aggregated data or a random sample and just kind of leave aside the questions that can't. Or you could develop methods that can automate data curation with high accuracy. Um, and these are all valid strategies. Um, but because there are questions that you really just can't get out with one, two, or three, I think that, that four is worthwhile. Okay, reason number four, um, delving into data curation um, changes what we view as data. So once you start thinking about how data is generated, you see that data can be used to answer questions in places you never thought to look for data. Um, which is a big part of the reason for teaching this course. Um, so even if you kind of never intend to implement deep learning methods, I think kind of once you have an understanding of what these methods are capable of, it really expands the range of questions that you think about as being testable hypotheses. Okay. Um, Reason number five, which is related, is that automated curation can open understudied context to research. Um, and so most off the shelf historical data sets, for example, um, focus on rich countries like the US or the UK. And few data sets have been digitized for lower income countries um, or really just countries like outside the US and Europe, even if they exist in hard copy. And so studying more diverse settings has the potential to enrich our understanding of many important questions and to ensure that our research responds to the concerns of all people and isn't so heavily skewed uh, towards groups that are easier to study that are in higher resource settings. Okay, manual data entry also tends to make the field fragmented. It's costly, the costs increase with the size of the data set um, whereas deep learning is the opposite. It has high fixed costs, but once you pay those, it scales well. Um, so let's say I was uh, digitizing some new data for an RD. And if I'm sitting there typing those data in manually, um, I'm only gonna digitize the observations that are right around the threshold that I need to run that RD. I'm not gonna you know, type in manually data that I, that I don't absolutely need. Um, whereas if I'm using deep learning to digitize the data, I might as well just process the entire data set. It's not that much more costly um, and could be used even just in terms of my private returns for like external validity, et cetera. Okay, now suppose there's some other researcher who would like to use those same data for a different question and that, that researcher has a different identification strategy. If all I digitized was the data around the threshold that is interesting to me, um, those data are not gonna be useful to that other researcher. Um, whereas if I've digitized the entire data set, it's now much easier for that other research team to answer their question. And so there's big externalities to that. Okay, and finally, automated curation can democratize access to data. Um, sending data off for manual entry requires significant monetary resources. Not everybody has that. And in fact, it's generally pretty hard um, to fund this type of research. Um, it's not free um, to run a deep learning model. Um, you need compute time and usually you need some annotations, um, but the costs tend to be more modest. And that's increasingly true the larger the data set. 
Um, automated curation is more intensive in human capital and less intensive in research funding. Um, and as I said, this becomes more pronounced as you have a bigger and bigger data set. Um, it can make projects that require large scale curation accessible to students and faculty who lack extensive funding but are willing to master um, and innovate um, the design of automated curation tools. And I think this is particularly beneficial in expanding the range of projects um, that students are able to pursue. Um, and if it makes it easier for people to curate data in general and people put this data into the public domain, even if you never use these methods yourself, the more data that is out there, um, you know, the, the, um, the better access to data will be. Okay, um, and then I'm gonna talk um, just briefly about how this differs from the digital humanities and computer science. Um, so we've discussed why there isn't an app and why manual data is unsatisfactory, but you might still be wondering isn't somebody else gonna make these innovations? And if I just wait a little while, they'll, then they'll be off the shelf tools to apply. Um, so certainly this work is made possible by groundbreaking innovations in computer science. Um, we couldn't even be thinking about automated data curation if it wasn't for those advances, um, but their applications are different in important ways. Um, and so most centrally, um, Implemented, implementing an automated curation pipeline for social science data typically requires building labeled data sets that resemble the information we want to process. Um, it also sometimes requires making some modifications to existing methods so that they're applicable to our objectives. Okay, and so I want to summarize just kind of a few main ways in which our applications tend to be different from the applications that these methods were developed for and tested on. So first of all, the vast majority of the object detection literature, um, which is what underlies document layout analysis, focuses on natural images. You know, it focuses on recognizing cats or telling if something's a horse or a zebra, or recognizing plants, face detection, um, you know, all those things, um, not on document images. I think that there's this view in the computer science literature that documents are kind of boring and kind of solved because like even in the 90s, like um, there's good recognition for checks, right? Um, you know, your bank can automatically read your check. Um, they're a very standard format. Um, and I think people have in their mind, like maybe a document is a tax form. This is something Microsoft should solve. It's just there's not a ton of research, um, but actually, as we've seen, it's far from a solved problem. Um, and also the commercial applications are just much vaster for natural images. Um, the subset of the literature that does examine documents primarily focuses on clean modern documents and other highly um, tailored use cases. Like again, like the commercial market is in like helping a business digitize its past tax forms. Um, and those are different typically from the documents that are of interest to us. And then finally, when it comes to NLP, um, in our data, if you're starting by digitizing your data, there's probably gonna be a lot of OCR errors. And it's just a really niche thing to think about NLP um, on data with OCR errors. There's some literature on, you know, um, tweets, you know, which might have typos and whatnot, um, but it's, it's a little bit different. Okay, and so I don't think it's likely that, you know, if we wait, the computer science will develop methods that can process our documents at scale. And that's essentially, um, you know, sort of for the same reason that there's not gonna be a commercial um, solution, um, which we've sort of, which we've already touched on. Um, and, you know, so that's our hope that we can lower the costs um, to, to social scientists of compiling the layout um, data, of fine tuning models um, that are required. And that's something that we'll be talking about like a lot in, in this course um, and that I've been working on, you know, making open source tools that can make it less costly. Um, same thing is true with NLP, right? I talked a little bit about GPT-3, 
how, you know, even if it kind of works, it's a black box um, and isn't very likely to be suited to um, academic research. You know, any model that's going to work without any fine tuning is probably huge as that how is how it works without fine tuning is it's just been exposed to so much already. If it's behind a paywall and there's no transparency, that's not really a great um, basis for your academic research. Um, and so you may say, well, why do I need to learn these methods? I understand there's not going to be a commercial solution. Others aren't going to solve these problems, but can I just collaborate with a computer scientist and I'll do the economics part and they'll do the deep learning part. Um, obviously, con collaborations are great, um, but often not possible. Um, the incentives in economic and computer science are fairly different. And as with all interdisciplinary partnerships, this can lead to frictions. Okay. Um, so, you know, incentives in economics, which you all are probably familiar with, um, we have a limited number of journals. Um, and with a few exceptions, there has not been a substantial expansion in publishing outlets as the field has grown. Um, researchers typically pay to submit to these journals, not to publish. And so the journals don't have a financial incentive to expand the number of papers that appear. And as a result, papers are long. You know, they oftentimes combine several different things. There's huge incentives, you know, to go big or go home, so to say, including with data curation. Um, and the economics largely disincentivize incremental contributions. They tend to be difficult to publish. There's not even many outlets for short papers, et cetera. Um, it's kind of the opposite in computer science. Um, it's common and professionally rewarded to publish in conference proceedings. Most of the path-breaking papers we'll see in this class were published in conference proceedings. These papers are short. Conferences may accept hundreds or thousands of papers. Um, and you pay to attend the conference, not to submit. Um, and so there are incentives to accept lots of papers, even though the top conferences are still pretty selective just because people in computer science write so many papers. Um, and so computer scientists publish many short papers. The vast majority of them make incremental contributions, although there's obviously you know, the groundbreaking stuff that changes the discipline in the world, but that's not most of it. Most of it's incremental. Um, it's not uncommon for pre-docs applying to grad school and CS to have more published papers than a tenure professor in economics. And in fact, that CV is kind of like a prerequisite um, for getting into a decent uh, grad program in computer science. Okay, and so for the bulk of contributions that aren't revolutionary advances, um, the publishing model um, tends to favor writing many incremental papers quickly. Um, and the way you do this is essentially to use benchmark data sets, um, which are well suited for this sort of incremental progress. And we'll see benchmark data sets over and over in this course. Um, so let me give an example of a benchmark data set. Um, from layout analysis, this data set is called PubLayNet and it consists of image scans of modern journal articles and their accompanying layout annotations that have been extracted from the PDF metadata. And so since they got these images from modern PDFs, there's no need for humans to annotate the layout regions because they can just be extracted from the PDF metadata. And hence it's nearly costless to produce a very, very large data set of scans and associated content uh, region annotations. And to use that data set as incremental improvements and you know, to, to make incremental improvements in algorithm design. If referees are trying to decide whether or not to accept the paper to the conference, if you use PubLayNet, they know what they're looking at and they know how to compare it to your incremental progress um, to other papers. And so there would be no incentive to like write a paper with one of us on our much more unique real world data set um, when that takes a lot of work to put together and people aren't going to know what they're looking at anyways. Um, and so there tends to be the use of these benchmarks. Um, and as I said, we'll kind of see benchmarks over and over again. Um, and um, incremental progress on the benchmarks is usually not of much relevant to our applications because you get incremental progress on the benchmarks by tailoring your model to the benchmark. Um, throughout the class, we'll see like these um, papers that really move the field of deep learning forward where people made massive improvements on these benchmarks. And usually that's indicative of something that's going to work well in general, but that's not most of the literature. Most of the literature is making small improvements on benchmark data sets, and that's not really relevant to us. Um, what we need is a cheap way to generate training data and incremental 
um, tailoring and methods towards the types of data sets that we like to curate, um, which is um, going to be a central topic that we cover. Um, I'll say quickly that we're also different from the digital humanities. Um, that in some ways, we have a lot of lot in common because we both work with noisy real world documents, you know, in contrast to the benchmarks that form the emphasis in computer science. Um, but their downstream analyses are pretty different from ours. Um, and that means their documents are different. And that means the type of noise that will invalidate whatever they want to do with those data are often quite distinct. Um, their documents have different layouts. Um, errors tend to be more catastrophic and harder to fix with post-processing in our quantitative documents. And the layouts of our quantitative documents make those errors um, more likely. Um, so this is an example data set um, you know, the, that I've worked on processing. These are firm level reports from Japan in the 1950s um, that give um, financial information about tens of thousands of firms. Um, each scan contains over a thousand layout elements, which by the way, is very different from a natural image. Um, it, company titles, addresses, specific variable names, their values, section headers. Um, and we need to detect the boxes, the bounding boxes in their classes of each of these individual elements. And we also need to associate these elements with each other to create structured data. The layouts, the word wrapping rules differ depending on the section of the table. And um, the information provided varies from firm to firm. And so obviously this is very different than digitizing a single column book where there might be a single layout element, i.e. one big text column on a page. Um, books with straightforward layouts are just much more likely to be of relevance to the humanities than to quantitative researchers where complex tables are super common. I mean, so hence the focus of the digital humanities tends to be more on downstream tasks, you know, like recognizing ancient languages. Um, without detecting layouts, if your research starts with document scans, you're not going to get to downstream tasks like NLP. Um, the project will just die um, when you can't do the layout analysis. Um, moreover, when layouts are complicated, OCR quality tends to decline. Um, text regions may fail to detect altogether. You know, um, also on complex layouts, you have more white space and that's going to bring in text bleed. Um, and so this is a big problem in our documents because spacing in tables or in other kind of structured documents is what tells you the layout. If you have a white page, there's always the risk of text bleeding through. If your documents are quantitative and it thinks that that text bleeding through is like a one, for example, it can, you know, change your number by an order of magnitude and just invalidate all of your downstream analysis. Whereas if you're like in the digital humanities and you get a stray one somewhere in your book, that's pretty easy to figure out that it doesn't belong there and remove it or else it's just not going to influence your analyses. Um, I'd say fortunately for us, these are challenging problems, um, but the concepts you know, i.e. the math um, that underlies deep learning is going to be very familiar to most economists. And I think it's, even if you have no background in deep learning, it's actually like pretty straightforward to get a grasp on it. Um, and so I think we're very well posed um, to deal with these challenges. And, you know, of course, I'm not trying to um, slam the humanities. I would really not want to be dealing with a document that was like handwritten ancient Chinese. I mean, it's hard in kind of its own way. Um, but the point is simply that the humanities and the social sciences are different. Okay, um, so that's all for today. Um, are there any questions? I'm going to also say we'll go over the syllabus in more detail next lecture now that you kind of guys have a general sense of um, what we're aiming to do. Um, so next lecture, we'll go over the syllabus in a little bit more detail, just as I said, now that you have a general sense of um, what we're aiming for. Um, and then I want to spend a little while talking about rules and kind of like, as I said, like all the time I wasted trying to make rules work and like throughout the course, it's not that I want to see you never want to use rules and I'll try to give you an intuition um, for when rules work. Um, but um, just also to give kind of a fair warning about how you can kind of get sucked into the rules trap and think they're going to work when they don't. Um, and then um, we'll also start just a broad introduction to machine learning and we'll continue that into 
on Monday. And in general, like how the course will work is I wanna give you guys an intuition for the literature and the models that underlie what we do. And so, you know, for example, when we talk about um, object detection, we'll start with an overview of CNN architectures, but I also wanna give you lots of practical insight just from my own kind of personal experience trying to do this and like how you take those models and actually kind of set up the problem. And so we'll kind of go back and forth between those two things, like a general overview of like what the models are. So it's not just a black box, um, but then also practically, like, how do I go about implementing this? Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to contact me or to contact uh, Jake, and we're happy uh, to try to answer them. And I'll see you guys on Wednesday.